Hey everybody and welcome to Q&A video number 63. Make sure you keep asking questions. Doesn't matter if they're bad. They can be about anything. Just know I don't respond to review requests or let's play requests in these videos, but we'll respond to those in the comments. Once again, a review request is what do you think about insert game here? Those are not for Q&As. Those are review requests. They will get added to the list if they're not already on the list. And that's pretty much it. Now, if you want to know what I think about a specific feature of a game or something surrounding it in the news or something like that, that's fair game, but don't just ask me about what I think about insert game here. Gameplay in the background is of Mountain Blade Warband because it ties in very heavily with the fourth question for this Q&A. But let's go ahead and start with a pretty quick one. Nuku asks, what kind of beverage do you prefer to relax or while gaming? Normally, I prefer to have something that will just make sure I'm awake, so something caffeinated, whether it be tea or a soda, with the latter being better at keeping me awake because it has sugar in it, and that provides more energy while I'm doing things. But generally speaking, when I'm trying to relax, I'll look for something a bit more like a tea or like a hot chocolate or something like that. And on rare occasions, usually just special occasions, like holidays or something like that, I will break out some alcohol and drink some of that, but I don't drink very much. I really don't like the taste of alcohol, so it's really more of just a single drink to be like, Prost! For whatever it is. So don't expect to see Tipsy DW ever, because that just doesn't happen. Anyway, let's move on to a question from Matoro Zelef, and he worded it very awkwardly, so I'm going to translate for him. He's basically wondering what I think the reason for sports games being released every year when uh, extreme sports games are not released every year is. The simple reason for it is that extreme sports just don't have the anywhere near the market that normal sports do. I can name exactly one person that I know who snowboards, for example, and that's it. At least off the top of my head anyway. I'd have to ask other people around if they do anything like that. I don't think I know anybody who skateboards anymore. And that sort of thing is just a far more niche market than, say, basketball or American football or soccer. And for some bizarre reason, people will continue to pay for just roster updates that are released every single year for 60 bucks. And who knows why they'll pay full price for it, but they do, so they keep putting out a yearly release of the same damn thing over and over and over again. Whereas extreme sports games are only released once in a blue moon and they don't do anywhere near as well. Just because the market really isn't there. Really the only one of those that was majorly successful as far as I can tell is Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. And that's only because it has Tony Hawk's name attached to it. And because a lot of people have nostalgia for that series because they just picked it up during the 90s when it was cool to be skateboarding. Now it's just kind of like a eh, whatever thing. So nobody really cares anymore. At least as far as I can tell, but in society at large anyway. There are a few people who still are into that sort of thing, but because the market isn't really that big for a, a skating game or a snowboarding game or something like that, they just don't put them out all that much. Next one is from Fusion Bunny. Season passes have become the main downside of gaming in 2015. That's very debatable. How do we deal with this, and will other elements like DLC and pay to win ever truly die out? DLC probably won't, because people keep paying for it. And honestly, DLC is only really a problem when it feels like they just ripped it out of the game to sell it on the side later. If it's things like cosmetics, I don't really mind those as much, I just don't get them. And if it's things like expansion packs that come out much later on down the line, for example, Dragon Age Inquisition's Trespasser DLC, then I'm less irritated about that sort of thing than I am about, say, the From Ashes DLC for Mass Effect 3 that was released on Day 1. Day 1 DLC is abhorrent, and frankly, it's just absolutely disgusting that they're able to get away with it. But people don't vote with their wallets, so it's going to keep happening. Pay to win is the same way. People don't vote with their wallets, so it keeps happening. Season passes, same thing, but... I don't really see those going away either simply because people refuse to vote with their wallets yet again. They look at a game that is released with a fairly low amount of content and they just go, oh, well, I'll get the season pass and then I'll have access to all this content later on down the line and I have no idea how good or bad it's going to be. It's pre-order culture at its finest, really, where season passes are a straight-up pre-order. They're a pre-order of DLC. 
And to be able to do away with that, we would have to do away with pre-order culture entirely, which obviously is not going to happen, considering how many people have both pre-ordered Fallout 4 as well as Star Wars Battlefront with its season pass, even though we have no idea what amount of content is going to be added in that season pass and so on and so forth. It's just frankly disgusting and depressing that we've hit a point where pre-order culture is just not going away, even though it serves literally no purpose other than to pad the uh, wallets of major corporations. And for some reason, people have absolutely no patience whatsoever and can't wait for a few days down the line or a few weeks down the line when the thing goes on sale and they can get it for a cheaper price. Nope, gotta have it now, so we gotta pre-order things, blah, blah, blah. It's just a vicious cycle that's going to keep repeating itself if we don't actually vote with our wallets and stop doing that. But unfortunately, people just refuse to do that because whatever reason. Anyway, let's move on to a question from Dragon Eye Studios and the uh, reason for Mountain Blade Warband being in this thing. What's your opinion on games that revolve around a more sandbox experience, such as Mountain Blade or the X series? Do you find the idea of storytelling through personal experiences in a sandbox game appealing, or do you find it open-ended to the point where you don't feel invested enough to care? Depends on the game. If it's like Minecraft and there is no point to the game at all, then I don't like that, because I feel like I have absolutely no direction whatsoever, I don't have a springboard to go off of, and it just lets me loose to just do whatever, and I don't play games to do whatever necessarily. I play games for a more targeted experience, and when it comes to something like, say, Mountain Blade, it gives you a lot of opportunities to just kind of do what you want to do. If you want to be a merchant, you can be a merchant. If you want to become a vassal to a lord and lead your faction to victory, you can do that. If you want to be a bandit, you can do that. If you want to be a uh, starter of your, your own faction and just rule all of Colorado and things like that, you can do all that sort of thing. And the game gives you the tools to do that right from the beginning and tells you, hey, you can do all this kind of stuff if you want to, but we're just going to leave it up to you where you go from here. And from there, you can craft the tale of your own specific character. Where, for example, you decide to make a female adventurer and you go to try to sign up with a bunch of the uh, various lords and at least one of them makes you their vassal, but they never reward you properly because... This being a medieval society, and your character being a woman, they just see it as just being absurd to reward you with fiefs and such like that. So what you do instead is you say, screw this, you rise up against your lord, and thus you have the tale of the rise of your character as potential queen of Colorado, and so on and so forth. And you just kind of put things together as you're going along. Some people get more invested in the story than others. I try to do something like that. But more often than not, I play something like a Mountain Blade Warband because I just enjoy the gameplay rather than going in for a specific, I'm going to create a story for myself here. And that is part of the problem because unlike in a more traditional, fairly linear video game where it actually has its own story and such like that, a sandbox game doesn't really have one. And so if it tries to get you to do a more story-driven kind of thing where you're creating the story yourself, it has to be handled pretty delicately. And most of these games don't do that, so they just kind of say, okay, well, we're going to provide all the gameplay, you do what you want with it. And that's usually what ends up working. Because if people want to create their own stories with that, they can do so. If people don't want to do that and they just want to play the game, then they can certainly do that as well. And that ends up working out. It's when a sandbox game tries to force a story on you or a sandbox game provides not anywhere near enough initial direction to get you going in a more story-driven sense that it becomes problematic for the actual storytelling. But ultimately, it's just up to the imagination of the player and what the game gives them to work with. And finally, we have a question from American Soldier which will probably be controversial for at least some of you because I know... A lot of you Europeans are very, very vehement in your stances on this, in particular Europeans anyway. What is your stance on guns in the Second Amendment? Do you think guns need more regulations or is something like that futile? Well, first things first. All that gun legislation that people keep parroting around doesn't really work in the U.S. because it's not the guns that are the problem. And I keep telling people this. It's not the fact that guns are available that is the problem in the U.S., it is that we have a culture of violence. 
Now you may think, oh, well, now DW is going to be ragging against video games and such like that. No, that's more of a reflection of how violent our society is. If you look on the news every single day, you're going to find some report of somebody getting murdered somewhere. Sometimes it's for drugs, sometimes it's just a person that just had enough and just ended up killing their spouse or something like that. Regardless, sure, it's tragic, but we're constantly having this reinforced to where one of the first solutions for any problem that pops into an American's mind is to commit violence, whether it just be beating someone up or outright killing them or in the case of things like what's going on in the Middle East right now. There are tons of people calling out for just straight-up invasions and such like that. It is mind-blowing just how incredibly prevalent violence is in American culture. And I'm not even really sure how we managed to get to this point, considering where we've been in the past, but it's at the point where people are just programmed to behave incredibly impulsively in American culture. We are programmed to just do whatever comes immediately to mind and not really think of what it's going to do. And so the first thing that comes to people's mind a lot of the times is to grab a gun and shoot somebody. And when you're having this both reflected and reinforced in your media, where, sure, it's constantly reflected in our violent video games, in our violent movies, in our violent TV shows, in our violent music, etc., it's being reinforced by both this prevalence of it in those medias, as well as the weird status it has in, for example, our news, where, like I said, you see this on the news all the time, but then when something really tragic, like, say, Sandy Hook happens, not only is it constantly on the news being parroted over and over and over again, but the way the media constantly reports this stuff, it ends up turning these really horrifyingly messed up people into celebrities. And it's just downright disgusting what we have come to. To where, instead of focusing on the victims, instead of focusing on just trying to prevent this cycle of violence in the future, trying to focus on things like improving our social safety nets for the poor and disenfranchised, things like improving our, frankly, horrendous mental health care system, instead of improving opportunities for people who are just under ridiculous amounts of stress to just outright be able to decompress. Because, I don't know if you guys know this, if you're especially not from the U.S., Americans are under a ridiculous amount of stress every single day. And part of it comes from the fact that we usually work a ridiculous amount of hours every single week, and yet don't have any vacation time, or we don't have any paid time off of any kind. For example, if you are a pregnant mother, and you need time off for maternity leave. You can't get that at a lot of American companies. They just won't do it. And you need to start taking vacation time for that. And they don't give any uh, paternity leave either for uh, fathers. So right off the bat, that's causing a lot of stress. You got the stress that most Americans, as far as I'm aware, are in some kind of debt where it's either a mortgage or student loans, which is just frankly ridiculous, or healthcare bills, or any number of these other things to where that's adding stress on their lives. Most of the stress that Americans face is actually related to finances in some regard. But regardless, all of this stuff just keeps being piled on, and that's in no small part a contributor to how much mental illness we have in this country. Most of it's depression. But it all adds up, and it culminates in this society where not only are we ridiculously impulsive, not only do we not think our actions through, not only is it constantly reinforced that our culture is violent and that that's just the way it is, so just whatever. Not only do we have all these mental health care problems, not only do we have, and not only do we have basically no safety nets whatsoever for the people who fall through the cracks, but what ends up happening is we have this culture that whenever a tragedy occurs, we say we want to do things, and then we just refuse to change anything. And it's mostly out of this idea that, oh, it would cost too much, or it's too difficult, so why bother doing it? And so what usually ends up happening is the public in general just decides to jump on a scapegoat, because that's a lot easier to do. And a lot of cases, the scapegoat is guns. 
Vast, vast majority of gun owners are incredibly responsible people. There are a few that make everybody else look really terrible, obviously, but the vast majority are perfectly fine people, and you have nothing to worry about from them. They're law-abiding citizens. They're not going to do anything negative with their uh, firearms. They go out to the range or something like that every so often and fire at some paper or steel targets, and that's no big deal. But that's not the common perception. The common perception is that they're all rednecks who just fire their guns into the air and just go, yee-haw, and all that sort of thing. And that's just not the case. It's just not reality. It's like that cultural perception of all British people having bad teeth or all French people being completely obnoxious and Germans having no sense of humor whatsoever and all sorts of things like that, where the reality is just not how people say it is. And when you talk about gun-related stuff, that's when a lot of misinformation gets thrown around. And it's kind of funny to think about this, too, because most people advocating gun control know absolutely nothing about guns. One of the common things you'll see that is thrown around is the amount of gun deaths in this country. And people fail to realize that the statistics are being manipulated to appear a certain way. You see, it turns out something like 63 to 65% of gun-related deaths in the U.S. are suicides. You don't hear about that. You only hear about the mass shootings or the uh, gang-related shootings or the spouse that went crazy and shot his wife and kids or whatever. And sure, that's tragic, but that doesn't reflect reality. Reality is that more Americans shoot themselves than they shoot each other. And if you remove guns from the equation, what is that going to change? Oh, well, they start hanging themselves instead? They start overdosing on drugs? Is that any better? No. Are stabbings and beatings and such any better than shootings? No, they aren't. And yet people seem to think that this is just somehow a cure-all, just to remove guns from the equation and therefore it's going to fix itself. No. You fix the underlying problems that cause the violence in the first place, and you won't need to worry about guns. They're not the problem. A gun is a tool. It's the person wielding the tool that decides how it gets used. And the vast, vast majority of gun owners in this country are perfectly fine people. They're not going to use it for any nefarious purposes whatsoever. There's that minority that do. And most of them don't give a crap about what the laws say anyway. So, what would this solve? It would take guns out of law-abiding citizens' hands and just keep them in the hands of criminals. Because that sounds so much better than just having a citizenry that can actually defend itself. Here's another thing that you need to keep in mind when it comes to the U.S. The ability to bear firearms is a constitutional right in the U.S. It's not in any other country as far as I can tell. In Europe, it's a privilege. In Australia, it's a privilege. In the U.S., it is a right confirmed by the Constitution. Americans have the right to carry firearms and defend themselves with them. This is not a right granted to them by the Constitution. It is confirmed by it. You have to keep in mind, this nation was founded by average citizens. It was not founded by a monarchy that then granted a bunch of rights to its citizens like it did in Great Britain, for example. But more important than the constitutional implications of this is this simple fact. You can't compare a country that does not have a violence problem and did away with guns and was like, oh, well, look, shootings went down to a country that has an endemic violence problem where we are brought up to basically be violent and say, oh, well, removing guns will fix things. Again, if you do not fix that problem of people being violent in the first place, it won't matter what your gun legislation is. You fix those problems, you fix the violence problem. And to take it back a bit to where I mentioned that most people who advocate gun control have absolutely no idea of anything about guns, I will give you a few examples. The first example being that a lot of people will refer to an AR-15 platform rifle or an AK pattern rifle as an assault rifle. Actually, the term assault rifle has a very, very specific definition. It's a select fire rifle. As in something that has a selector switch on it that can alternate between a semi-automatic firing mode, which is one squeeze of trigger equals one shot, and multiple 
other kinds of operations where usually it's a fully automatic or a three round burst configuration where you hold the trigger and it keeps firing which is fully automatic or you press the trigger once and it fires three rounds which is three round burst. I have seen others that have different uh, numbers of burst fire on them but the concept is the same. An assault rifle is select fire. You can switch between firing modes. A lot of people seem to think you can just go to any gun store in the US and just buy one. You can't. Those have been very tightly regulated since 1986, in fact. It's rather hard to get your hands on a machine gun or an assault rifle in the US. They are ridiculously expensive, and they require you to go through a very large amount of paperwork, and background checks, and such like that. So, no, you can't just go around buying assault rifles and using them willy-nilly. What you're thinking of is a rifle that happens to be based on a military platform and has been configured for a more civilian market. Next concept, the idea of the Wild West. This country really isn't the Wild West. A lot of people seem to think that if you walk down the street in the US, for some reason you need to be packing heat, otherwise you're just going to die. No, I grew up in the Midwest. There were a lot of guns where I lived. In fact, it was more common to know someone who either had a gun or knew somebody who had a gun than it was to run into somebody who was for gun control. And yet, I never once feared for my life. I never once felt the need to carry a firearm, and not once did I ever feel the need to own one. Even when going through areas of town that were considered especially bad, things that were uh, riddled with, for example, drugs and that sort of thing, I never really felt the need. Just paid attention to my surroundings and made sure I wasn't making myself vulnerable to begin with, and no big deal. This is something that the media loves to throw around as this kind of thing to scare you into supporting gun control because the world is a scary place. Well, your chances of getting shot in the US are actually very low, believe it or not. In fact, you're far more likely to die in a car accident than you are to be shot. I don't see people calling for tighter regulations on drivers, or cars, or car manufacturers, or whatever. Yet, guns are an easy target for that, because they're scary. And that's one of the big problems with it. People who advocate gun control know nothing about them and find them scary. When, in reality, they're not scary. If you lay a gun down on a table, it's not going to just sprout arms and legs and run around and start shooting people. It's just going to sit there. It's not going to do anything. It's the user that decides what to do with it. And the people deciding things about gun control are not the kind of people who should be making decisions about that. To give you an example, there was a proposed assault weapons ban, which is hilarious because there is no such thing as an assault weapon, in case you didn't know that. It's a made-up term by gun control advocates. The gun community has no idea what an assault weapon actually is. It seems to just refer to anything that looks scary. And the case in point is that during the debates on this proposed assault weapon ban, which thankfully did not pass, there was a bit about barrel shrouds being banned. Now, if you don't know what a barrel shroud is, you can just break the name down. Barrel shroud. It's a shroud that goes over the barrel to prevent you from burning your hand while firing the firearm. That's it. It doesn't increase rate of fire, it doesn't increase the velocity of the round going out of the chamber, it doesn't increase the stopping power or whatever. It just looks scary to a lot of gun control advocates, so they're just like, well, we should ban this thing. And the even funnier part about this was when asked about what a barrel shroud was, if they even knew what it was, one of the proponents of this proposed legislation literally told the person asking them, is that the shoulder thing that goes up? Those are the kind of people who are making decisions about gun control and advocating gun control. People who know absolutely nothing whatsoever about firearms. People who are just scared of them. People who just throw around these ridiculous accusations, these ridiculous, very clearly altered statistics to just try to twist things to their own devices when they really don't want to actually solve the real problems that are causing the violence in the first place. And they just want to use guns as a scapegoat to both further their own political agendas and provide a feel-good solution for the public. I hate to break it to you folks, but all of the legislation we've thrown around at gun control hasn't really done anything. 
that legislation that severely restricted machine guns and assault rifles and such had no effect on crime. That so-called assault weapons ban we had during the Clinton administration did nothing. All those did was keep certain kinds of firearms out of the hands of perfectly law-abiding citizens who weren't going to do anything negative with them anyway, who were just going to go to the range and have fun with them. And honestly, considering how incredibly ineffective gun control is in the U.S., why do we even bother suggesting it at this point? If anything, we should look at repealing some of the legislation, because again, it didn't do anything and it still doesn't do anything. Again, we need to focus on the real problems, the things that are actually causing the violence in the first place. Nobody wants to do that because that's not quick and easy. And unfortunately, that's the reality of the U.S. Nobody wants to do things the hard way. They want the quick and easy path, as Vader did. And throwing around a bunch of stuff that isn't going to affect anyone except the people who already aren't doing anything wrong doesn't help. And frankly, if anything, it only hurts the situation more. Anyway... I got rather long-winded with that, I do apologize for that, but gun control is a topic that really grinds my gears just because there's so much misinformation being thrown around by gun control advocates in particular, but to some degree also gun proponents. I do consider myself pro-Second Amendment, but I'm not the kind of drooling NRA nuthead that you see just throwing around complete nonsense all the time. I look at things from a more realistic perspective. What has gun control done for this country? Basically nothing. So why bother with that sort of thing when we can just look at things that will actually help the community at large and probably fix the violence problem in and of itself rather than simply the gun violence problem? If you remove the gun violence problem, you still have a violence problem. It's just not with guns. That doesn't help things. Anyway, if you have more questions about this or my actual interest in firearms, which is mostly historical firearms like the 1800s and such like that, then feel free to throw some questions around, but otherwise, make sure to keep asking questions. I will catch you guys in later videos.